If you're like a lot of golfers who are confused by what to work on, uh, who are frustrated from years and years of going in circles without seeing uh, any real improvement, or uh, who are limited in the amount of time you can play in practice uh, due to a busy work and family life, uh, then you come to the right place. Hi, my name is Jacob Outen, and today I'm going to share with you uh, the keys of what took me from a 14 handicapper to a professional golfer. Like many of you, I was not a child golfing prodigy. I remember in my first junior golf event in St. Louis, I shot 70-48 for 118 uh, on 18 holes, which was fairly typical for me at the time. In high school, I played one season on our golf team, and breaking 50 on nine holes was my barometer for a good round. And after I got out of college and I got a job as a computer engineer in Kansas City, uh, I joined a weekly golf league, and I started working on my game a bit more, and I whittled my handicap down to 14. By that point, uh, breaking 90 on 18 holes was considered a pretty good day, and for the most part, I was happy to get a drive out past the 225 yard marker of the driving range. Then at age 27, I decided to quit my corporate job and I moved out to California to pursue a golf career. Uh, within two months of working with an instructor named Dan Schauger, I shot my first 18 hole round of golf under par in the 60s, and I added 63 yards to my longest drive. Within six months of meeting Dan, I won the Pinnacle Distance Challenge with the televised 381-yard uh, drive. Uh, shortly after, um, I went on to win multiple qualifiers for the Remax World Long Drive Championships, uh, including a venue record 421-yard drive. Um, I've also made multiple cuts in week-long professional golf tournaments around the world with uh, rounds in the 60s and 70s. And most recently, I finished fifth at the CBS uh, televised Speak Golf World Championships held abandoned dunes. While you may not have the same aspirations as I do, certainly there are some, still some things that you can take away from my uh, personal transformation from uh, 14 handicapper to professional golfer that you can apply towards achieving your own goals. First, we'll talk about some things to get your equipment sorted out, and then we'll move into the various aspects of practicing and playing out on the course. Let's get started. Having been around the industry for over 10 years and having tried all sorts of different equipment and club combinations, I can tell you that getting a custom fit for a set of clubs can really help your performance. I liken it to wearing the right uh, shoe. Uh, for example, if you play basketball under size 10 and a half, it wouldn't help your performance to wear a size 8 or a size 13 in football cleats. Uh, the same general idea applies to golf. Now, if you're a beginner or a high handicapper, you might think that you're not good enough to get custom fit or that you'll uh, uh, make the equipment change once, once you get better. Uh, however, you'd actually stand to benefit the most from custom fitting because oftentimes uh, good players are skilled enough to make adjustments to their swing uh, to force a certain club to work for them. Plus, as a beginner or a high handicapper, it's better to develop good golf habits based around equipment that works for you. Presently, most major golf companies do offer a, uh, uh, offer a range of fitting options. Uh, from them, you can get clubs that vary in any number of things like color, shape, loft, uh, weight, shaft stiffness, etc. While this level of fitting is better than simply buying something randomly off the rack, uh, what you may not realize is that the tour players that you see on TV and who promote these uh, brands actually play and are fit with clubs that are often that often have completely different specifications uh, than what you're buying off the rack at your local golf shop. For this reason, I'd really encourage you to visit the AGCP, Association of Golf Club Fitting Professionals, uh, the ICG, International Club uh, Makers Guild, and or uh, the Tom Wachan Golf Technology websites, uh, where you can find listings of reputable independent club fitters that can help you assemble your own set of custom clubs. You should be aware that many of these club fitters uh, will sometimes work out of their own garages uh, and perhaps use brands of clubs that aren't necessarily household names. However, as a professional who's experienced uh, tour department fittings um, and who presently has chosen not to take a paid sponsorship with a major equipment company and who's worked with many uh, independent uh, club fitters, 
I can tell you that the independent club fitters who have the right tools can give you the same level of personalized fitting uh, that a tour player gets from a major club manufacturer's tour department uh, and or equipment trailer um, when they're out on tour. As a bonus, since these club fitters are sometimes working with off brands, uh, many times the total cost ends up being the same anyway as you would have spent purchasing a set of clubs uh, from a major manufacturer if it doesn't even fit you as well. For that matter, uh, even if the club fitting, uh, the custom fitting is a bit more, it's still also better in the long run because of how much money and time you'll save from doing it right the first time. With all that being said, here are a few things to consider when working with the club fitter and assembling your set of custom clubs. Since we're allowed by the rules to play with 14 clubs, it makes sense that most major equipment companies want uh, to convince you to fill your bag up with all 14 clubs. After all, they're publicly traded companies and thus they're motivated to sell clubs and gener uh, generate uh, profit for their shareholders. Um, it's business and it's totally understandable. So it's common these days to see clubs sold in a set makeup that looks something like this. However, just because we're allowed 14 clubs doesn't mean we really need to have that many in our bag. In fact, uh, the top speed golfers in the world usually only carry four to six clubs in their bag and can still uh, shoot par or better. Uh, when I finished fifth at the 2012 Speed Golf World Championships, I was only carrying six clubs and easily shot in the 70s both rounds. Uh, but as for regular golf, uh, consider the professional level that a male uh, tour player's average driver swing speed is around 113 miles an hour with 290 yard drives. Uh, typical senior tour players around 106 miles an hour, 275 yard drives. Compare that to male amateurs who swing around 90 miles an hour and hit 225 yard drives, and many amateur seniors who swing around 75 miles an hour and hit 190 yard drives. One thing that happens when your swing speed gets slower uh, is that you'll have less carry distances between all your clubs, and everything starts bunching up eventually get to a point where uh, the distance difference between clubs isn't all that much. Uh, perhaps you've experienced something like this where two adjacent clubs, for example, uh, six iron and seven iron seem to go about the same distance. If this is you, it might be better to take out your odd or even clubs and only use a half set. Um, the nine club Wushan 730CL custom set is actually designed just for this reason to accommodate uh, players with slower swing speeds who don't need as many clubs. Furthermore, since you probably don't play in practice as your full-time job, having fewer clubs in your bag also means it's easier to master the clubs you do have, not to mention it's just less clubs to carry around anyway. I think it's a good idea that one of the clubs in your bag be something that you can hit for maximum distance off the tee. Typically, people think of this uh, as a driver. However, much for the same reason that we already discussed about how much or how most amateur men and amateur senior men have swing speeds that are slower than that of a regular tour or senior tour player. Sometimes the club that the tee shot uh, that you hit the farthest could be a fairway wood or even a hybrid or iron. Achieving maximum distance requires a combination of both the ball taking off at a certain angle and also having a certain amount of backspin. The slower your swing speed, the higher the ball needs to take off and the more spin you need. And the more spin you need, the more loft you need. For example, uh, if you or someone you know hits your three wood farther than your driver, it's probably partially because uh, the launch conditions, given how fast you can swing, are more optimal with a three wood than your lower lofted driver. It's simply a matter of not having enough speed to get something with that low of loft up in the air. Your club fitter can help you get dialed in and to do it optimally, uh, he or she will need a launch monitor. Um, but here are some general average numbers to shoot for with your driver or whatever club you use off the tee based on your driver's swing speed.
Also, don't be afraid to go to a tee shot club that is shorter in length, even if that means something that's 42, 43 inches or whatever. Uh, the rules allow us to play a, a club that is long, as long as 48 inches. Uh, however, in general, the longer the club, the more difficult it is to make solid contact. Solid contact is important because even missing the sweet spot by as little as an inch can cost you over 20 yards. So if your club fitter recommends that you use a shorter driver or a shorter club, I would definitely go with that advice. Whether you're a good player, an average player, or just a beginner, I would highly suggest you consider using a set of uh, one iron golf same length irons. I actually shot my first tournament round in the 60s using a set of their irons. With a modern conventional set of uh, irons from four to pitching wedge, the irons normally decrease by three to five degrees in loft each club and also get about half inch shorter in length as you move from the four iron down to the pitching wedge. To accommodate the different shaft lengths, uh, the weight of the club heads also gets heavier by six to eight grams uh, each club, so the shorter clubs don't feel dramatically different than the longer ones. However, um, for consistency's sake, the one iron irons have all been designed with four degree gaps between uh, each club, and they also have the same head weight from club to club as that of a six or seven iron which means uh, they can uh, all be made to the same club length as that of a six or seven iron. Some people would argue that the three to five irons wouldn't go as far with shorter shafts and the eight to pitching wedge would go too far with longer shafts. However, club length only has a minimal effect on how far you hit a club. The primary determinant of how far the ball goes is the loft on the club. So what people find with the one irons is that when comparing loft to loft with their other clubs, they not only get more or less the same distance gaps they do with a conventional set of irons, but they are much more consistent as well. So no matter what your skill level, if you want to hit more greens and be a more consistent iron player, you should definitely give them a try. Uh, if it sounds interesting to you, make sure to use coupon code 10507 when you check out. I've taken the liberty of setting this coupon code up so that you can try them uh, for a full 30-day money-back guarantee, which is an offer that's extremely rare when it comes to buying equipment. Although I think the one iron wedges are perfectly fine to use, uh, if you're still insistent that you want to go a more conventional route with your wedge or wedges, uh, then I suggest considering several things when doing this. Again, it may be useful to bring a custom club fitter that you trust into the equation to help uh, get you dialed in. Loft-wise, it's become more popular these days uh, for tour players to use a 60 or even a 64 degree wedge as their highest lofted wedge. That being said, uh, tour greens are usually very firm and very fast and can necessitate these higher lofted wedges. Conversely, uh, golf courses that many amateurs play are a bit softer and slower. Uh, there's really no need for that amount of loft on these type of courses during their normal day-to-day uh, -day conditions. Not to mention that the higher lofted wedges are often very difficult for a lot of mid and high handicappers to hit well. You can work with your club fitter to determine the highest loft you need for the courses you normally play, uh, but I'm guessing it would only be between 54 degrees and 58 degrees. Now, Rocco Media, a six-time PGA Tour winner, uses nothing higher than 56 degrees, and personally, the highest lofted wedge I have uh, in my bag right now is 55 degrees. As for other wedges, you may not need three or four, three or even four wedges. Uh, you might be fine with only two, just a pitching wedge and a chipping or sandwich. Uh, for example, if the lofts are 48 degrees and 54 degrees. Uh, however, if you have a higher swing speed, um, if you play hard and fast greens that require higher shots, or if your pitching wedge is lower lofted at maybe 45 or 46 degrees, then you might also opt for something like a 52 and a 58. Again, your club fitter can help you figure out what will work best for you on the courses that you normally play. As for the bounce and sole width, having an appropriate amount of each on your wedge can really be helpful. 
Uh, the bounce is the curvy part of the wedge on the bottom of the club. The more curve, the more bounce. Uh, bounce and uh, a wide sole are both especially useful in thick rough or bunkers with lots of sand where you don't want the club to dig in. If you find yourself hitting the ground before you hit the ball around the green, or if you leave a lot of bunker shots in the bunker and or don't get them all the way to the flag, it's possible uh, you don't have enough bounce or a wide enough sole in your wedge or wedges. Again, this is something that your club fitter can help you with. It's possible to putt okay with a putter that doesn't really fit you well. Uh, however, why not get something that accommodates the way that you putt? First, decide on whether you want a long putter, a belly putter, or a normal length putter. Long putters are easy on the back because you don't have to bend over as much. Uh, belly putters can help provide stability if you're a little jerky with your stroke. Although they do require that you uh, have more of an arcing type of stroke. Someone who likes to have the putter moving straight back and straight through probably won't like a belly putter. Uh, then there's the normal length putters. Second, based on whether you have more of a straight back, straight through type of stroke or an arcing type of stroke, pick out a head shape and a shaft type that works with that particular stroke style. Uh, for a straight back, straight through stroke, look for putters that are face balanced and that are either center shafted or with a double bend shaft in them. Um, a face balanced putter, uh, putter's putter face will face the sky when you balance the putter shaft horizontally and let the putter head hang naturally by gravity. For an arcing stroke, look for putters with toe hang or that are shafted straight into the hosel or those with a single bend. Putters with toe hang will have the toe of the putter head hang lower than the heel when you balance the putter shaft horizontally and let the putter head hang naturally by gravity. Third, figure out what length and lie angle fits your natural setup. A lie angle that's too upright will have the toe sitting up in the air and one that's too flat will have the heel more up in the air. And the final major thing to adjust is the loft. Uh, this is important because too much loft can cause the ball to subtly uh, skip and bounce. Uh, whereas the right amount will get the ball rolling immediately. Ideally, it's best to have a loft that gets the ball rolling right away. But depending on your stroke, this may be a putter anywhere between about zero and seven degrees. If you've got a high-speed camera, you can see if the ball is skipping before rolling or rolling right away by drawing a line on the ball and zooming in on the first foot or so of the ball's initial movement. Back when I was shooting in the 80s, 90s, and 100s, uh, typically I played balls I found on the course. Uh, at the time, this was primarily just a financial matter for me. It was cheaper to play balls I found and uh, retrieved out of the bushes, water hazards, etc. Of course, I could tell that some balls were a little harder or softer than others. However, <clears throat> I also assumed that more or less they'd each perform the same. And boy, did I ever underestimate that. As I was becoming a better player, uh, I remember I went through a ball fitting session with a company that independently tested around uh, 50 different brands of balls that were on the market at the time. Now, believe it or not, there was literally a 19% difference in my driving distance average between the shortest ball and the longest ball, and they were all new balls. Uh, for your average golfer, this could mean the difference between a 200-yard drive and a 240-yard drive. Thus, you can imagine how difficult it is to be consistent and get the ball close to the flag when there can conceivably be that much of a distance difference between different models of balls. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean you need to play the most expensive ball. Uh, there are great performing balls uh, at affordable prices. Uh, for that matter, once you know exactly the type of ball you want, you can uh, order high quality used golf balls online and virtually every brand imaginable. However, the important thing to take away is that you should uh, work with your club fitter to find the general class of ball that will complement your golf game. Normally, each golf ball manufacturer offers multiple models 
designed to work well with various types of golfers. There's balls available that spin more or less, that fly higher or lower, uh, that feel softer or harder, that go uh, farther or shorter depending on your club head speed, etc. Once you know the general type of ball to look for, then you can pick out a brand that you like, and if cost is still a factor, you can shop around uh, to find that particular ball at a price that's affordable to you. There are limits that the governing golf bodies uh, have placed on how golf clubs are allowed to perform. Uh, so despite what you may have read or seen to the contrary, if you're truly interested in being more consistent and shooting lower scores, there's really very little reason performance-wise to ever change your equipment again once you go through a good custom fitting. I think it's important for you to realize uh, that most major equipment companies are publicly traded companies. Thus, it's their job and the players that they pay a lot of money to sell you as many clubs each year as they can. Uh, for that matter, these same manufacturers pay TV networks, uh, magazines, both print and online, uh, various bloggers, etc. Huge amounts of money in advertising dollars. Therefore, uh, you should take what you see and hear in those places with a grain of salt because those media outlets are cautious about saying anything bad about who's paying their bills. Granted, uh, there's been some minor improvements in the forgiveness of clubs in the new millennium. That being said, if you look at the average PGA Tour driving distance over the last 10 years or so, you'll notice that the average player today is driving at the same distances as players from 10 years ago. Uh, despite what the ads say, uh, driving distances really aren't any longer. A great deal of the latest clubs are really nothing more than clubs with new paint jobs, slightly different head shapes, uh, a clever marketing phrase with some fancy sounding words in them, etc. With irons, the loft of last year's six iron uh, is stamped as this year's seven iron. And oftentimes the stronger lofts are really the reason why the iron, go, uh, the iron set goes farther and not from some incredible technological uh, breakthrough. That's also actually why one and two irons have mostly disappeared and uh, now even three irons. Uh, that is, in order to sell more clubs, manufacturers have kept lowering their lofts of their iron sets and telling you their irons were going farther uh, until those longer irons basically became uh, unplayable. For the same reason, uh, that's how the gap wedge came into existence. An old pitching wedge used to be 50 degrees. And today, some pitching wedges are 45 degrees or even less, basically an old 9-iron. Thus, as the lofts changed, too great of a gap was created between the pitching wedge and sand wedge, and the gap wedge needed to be created. I could go on, um, but the gist of my point is that once you've been properly fit for your set of clubs, uh, resist the lure of buying new clubs if your primary goal is to score better, or at least use a great amount of caution when considering making any future changes to your set. Um, I've played with some great players, uh, guys that have even played in majors, the Masters, British Open, uh, and the golfer that, is, that has the best short game I've ever seen uh, has been uh, using the same two wedges for over 20 years. That uh, constant introduction of new equipment into your bag, especially if you're an amateur that might only play once a week, um, it, actually can do more harm than good because at the, the rate that you play it can take half the season to get comfortable with any new clubs. And by the time you finally start getting used to the club, out comes the new model that promises to finally fix your game and the cycle continues at the expense of you not ever mastering what you already have. Now that we've gone through and got your equipment uh, sorted out, let's talk about how and what to practice. To get better uh, at anything, it's important to devote some amount of time to improving your golf skills. That being said, I'm also assuming that you have a busy life and have limited practice time. Now, that's the way it is for me. So in this section, I'm going to give you a one hour practice routine that you can do once per week. If you can practice more, that's great. Um, in that case, all you need to do is expand the one hour practice out in the same proportions to however long you want to practice. 
I should point out that uh, in an ideal situation, it's great if you're a member at a country club that uh, isn't so busy so that you can practice out on the course. Um, however, this probably won't be the case for most people. Uh, fortunately, most courses have some sort of dedicated practice area with the driving range uh, and short game bed. As such, uh, the practice session I'm going to cover now will be designed to work with such a practice area. We're also going to cover some basic information about how and why balls curve uh, because it will be much easier to intelligently troubleshoot problems with your swing when you, under, uh, when you have an understanding of how ball flight works. Let's first uh, start with getting a better understanding of ball flight um, and then we'll move into our practice session. It used to be thought that the path of your swing controlled the start direction and the direction of the club face would be where the ball would end up. However, uh, thanks to recent advances in radar and photographic technology, we now know that that's not true. So what makes a ball curve the way it does? And uh, what else is useful to know about impact and ball flight? The first thing I want you to understand is the initial uh, direction that the ball starts off is primarily determined from where the club face is aimed at the moment of impact. So if the club is pointed left of the targeted impact, the ball will start off towards the left of the target. If the club is pointed right of the target, the ball will start towards the right. And if the club is pointed at the target, the ball will start off at the target. Second, assuming that you hit the ball in the sweet spot, uh, your ball should curve when there's a difference between where the club is pointing uh, relative to the swing path. So if the club face is in line with the swing path, the ball won't curve. If the club face is open to the swing path, the ball will curve away from you. And if the club face is closed to the swing path, the ball will curve back towards you. And with these two bits of information, you can do a fair amount of self-troubleshooting with your swing. For example, let's say uh, you're a right-handed golfer who has a slice and you want to draw the ball instead. Since we know that the starting direction of the ball is primarily indicative of where the club face was pointing at impact, we can assume that your club face was probably pointed left of the target. Then to make the ball curve back towards the target, your swing path probably was even further left of where the club face was pointing. To flip that around and make, you, uh, make your ball draw instead, we need to have your club face pointed right at the target and have your swing path be even further right of that. This can be really scary because to keep the ball from slicing right, we actually have to swing out further to the right, uh, perhaps even with what looks like uh, way out to the right from your viewpoint standing over the ball. This can seem counterintuitive without having knowledge of how ball flight works. However, hopefully this explanation of what needs to produce that draw can help you overcome the fear of swinging more to the right if that fear exists for you. Third, uh, things can change a little bit when you miss the sweet spot. Uh, for example, let's say you hit the ball out on the toe. What happens then is that since the center of mass of the club is not moving directly into the center of mass of the ball, it causes the club to open up, which may, uh, much like how a gear works, makes the ball turn the other way. So a toe hit can cause a ball to curve back towards you. Conversely, a ball hit on the heel of the club can cause the ball to curve away from you. This phenomenon is actually why there's a bit of horizontal curve on drivers, fairway woods, and some hybrids. Uh, the bulge, as it's called, it causes toe hits that will curve back towards you to actually start out, uh, start, out the, uh, start the ball out further away from you to help the ball end up on target. It's sort of a built-in forgiveness to the club. 
But what happens when you hit the ball high or low on the club face? Loft is the primary uh, determinant of spin. So the more loft there is, the more spin there will be. Uh, that's partially why a three iron has less backspin than a wedge. So when you hit the ball towards the top of the club face, uh, similarly, the center of gravity of the club is not directly colliding with the center of gravity of the ball. That causes the club face to angle more upward, uh, which causes the ball to spin the other direction. This reaction doesn't actually cause top spin, but rather counteracts some of the built-in backspin that you get from the loft of the club. So basically, the ball will just spin less. Conversely, a ball hit low on the club face uh, will spin more. There's also a vertical curve uh, called roll on most drivers, woods, and hybrids. Unfortunately, I think having vertical curvature like this is somewhat of a design flaw in today's equipment, um, primarily because hitting a ball low on the face uh, will make the ball launch too low. Uh, this is actually one of the big reasons why I recommend uh, getting drivers, woods, and hybrids from Wushan Golf. Um, like other companies, Tom Wushan, um, has drivers, woods, and hybrids that are designed with uh, horizontal, uh, horizontal curvature, which helps your balls finish more on target. Um, however, he puts a minimal amount of vertical curvature, which helps launch the ball at a more consistent launch angle. Uh, there's still less spin from a ball hit on the top of the face, and more spin from one hit on the bottom, but the launch trajectories are much more predictable and it enables a higher swing speed player uh, to more easily play a driver from the fairway if they want to. Lastly, things also change when you catch the ball in the downswing or on the upswing. Since we have to stand next to the ball when we hit it and can't swing directly over it, our swing arc is tilted. That means that when you catch the ball in the downswing, uh, the ball will start out more away from you because the club face is not pointing in the same direction as it is when the club levels out. Similarly, when you catch the ball in the upswing, uh, the ball will start more towards you than at a level strike. This is just something good to be aware of when hitting down or up on the ball. For example, if you hit down with your irons and uh, up with your driver, uh, because um, it can influence what you need to do to get the ball started where you want it to start. This is also the reason why you can hit a draw that starts away from the target and comes back, uh, comes back to it, even if you have divots that point to the near side of the target. Basically, the ball sits slightly on the downswing at a point when the face is pointed away from the target and path even further away. Uh, the ball leaves the club face and starts drawing back towards the target, and then the club bottoms out at the bottom of the swing arc and leaves a divot in the direction of the near side of the target. 